And I, I sometimes say it's a book not about clarity. It's a book about confusion. And I think in a way that's important because there are too many clarities being floated around left, right and center. And I think it's exactly the time to question those clarities. Questioning has become something which is actually looked down upon in today's world. You mean the politics of today's world. Hello and welcome to the South Asia Review of Books podcast from Himal South Asian, where we speak to celebrated authors and emerging literary voices from across South Asia. I'm your host, Shweta Srikantan, Associate Editor at Himal South Asian, coming to you from Colombo. And here with us today are the International Booker Prize winning author translator duo, Geetanjali Shri, joining us from Delhi, and Daisy Rockwell, joining us from Vermont to talk about their latest book, Our City That Year. Geetanjali Shri's Our City That Year, translated by Daisy Rockwell, is a tale of a city under siege, reflecting a society that lies fractured along fault lines of faith and ideology. First published in 1998, Our City That Year is loosely based on the communal riots and violence that led to the demolition of the Babri Masjid in 1992, and its aftermath of rising uncertainty and dread. 26 years after its original Hindi publication, the book's call to bear witness to India under the grips of religious nationalism is timelier than ever, speaking to the growing divisions across the subcontinent's borders. Geetanjali and Daisy, welcome to the South Asia Review of Books podcast, and thank you so much for joining us to talk about this excellent book. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I want to take our listeners right back to the start. Tell us about your first encounters with each other's work and how you first began working on the Booker Prize winning novel Tomb of Sand and now Geetanjali's second novel Our City that year in translation. Yeah, well, I think it starts with me because um, the translator Arunava Singha asked me to look at Red Samadhi, which, I, which is what uh, the Hindi name of Tomb of Sand maybe right after it was published, so that was 2018, right? And after that, I uh, he put me in touch with Gitanjali and I sent her a small sample to get her permission. So that was how we initially made contact, I think. I, th- I, th- I think the important thing there is that we actually didn't know each other or too much about each other's work before... We actually started work, um, start you know, collaborated on um, um, Great Samadhi Tomb of Sand. So uh, I heard about Daisy when uh, the publisher got interested in um, tra- you know getting this book translated and publishing it. And like Daisy said, she sent me a sample, and I was quite amazed, you know, that a book which is absolutely everybody accepts that it is not an easy book. So here's somebody who did a, a rough and ready. A sample of it and seemed to have you know, got it already. So I was actually very pleasantly surprised and very happy to go ahead. And it was a risk for both of us because we really learned, we really got to know each other as we went along. But I think it was a risk which um, worked well. And the more we got to know each other and the more we kind of interacted and you know, corresponded, I think we, the enjoyment and everything grew and uh, along the way I also got to know more about Daisy and her work I knew that she had already done uh, translated some very important writers and difficult writers like Krishna Sopti who's you know the writer I've dedicated the novel to so I think and I hope she heard good things about me yeah as well in the process (laughs) absolutely in fact we really got to know each other as we went along (laughs) I asked Krishna Sobhati when um when I first got the book, I asked her what she thought of it, and she said Gitanjali is a very good writer. So that was, I had a recommendation from her herself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then this book, um, after the Booker win, we were talking about what if I might do some another Gitanjali work, and and she really wanted. This had never been translated before, um, and so we talked about it for some time and then decided to do it. That's really great to hear, and I think that 
appreciation for each other's works really comes through in the text. And Geetanjali, you have a background in history, and you started writing the novel even before the events of 1992. And the story was further shaped by communal riots and socio-political events that have continued along the same trajectory across India. And the year 2024 sadly makes the prescience of the book all the more relevant with the inauguration of the Ram Mandir in Ayodhya and subsequent election. So how did our city that year first come together and what was it like to write a story that continues to bear so much political weight? You know, the things you are saying and the question you are asking, I mean, uh, it's really, really important. And I'm very uh, anxious that I should um, answer it as best as I can. And I'm, of course, worried, you know, that I won't be able to get all the layers of what I think across. I'm going to try. So, you see, you speak uh, of uh, 1992. And you speak of uh, 2024. And I think there's the danger of becoming a bit reductionist if you just, you know, if, if you identify a work of literature just with some very specific events. Of course, these events are important. They are uh, even watershed moments. But in literature, in art and literature, I think, Events, specific events are triggers for something which is much larger, for a whole phenomenon. And, you know, and when you say uh, 1992, I mean, let me tell you that this is, uh, for me, 1992 is not an isolated uh, moment. For me, it's really something I have lived with through my life. You know, I have a childhood which has, you know, memories of partition and, uh, all kinds of things that had been happening between these two major communities in India. So I have a whole phenomenon, you know, which is always unfolding around me, and that is my reality. And it's really that which um, engages me right through. And at some point, some major event becomes the trigger to make me speak about, uh, you know all these things, and that is why I, you know, I also call it. Um, you, you read the book. I call it Hamara Sheher as well as our city that year, and I think it. Uh, the, the book brings out that it is not one city, and it is not one year. So it is not just about, you know, two moments. It's really about. I would say that uh, um, engages with the whole phenomenon of what goes wrong with human beings, what leads to all kinds of, you know, hatred, bigotry, narrowness, divisive tendencies, doubts and suspicions. And so it's a, really an engagement with uh, how people who have lived together through history in a particular geography for centuries, what are the things that keep them together? What are the things that, uh, you know, just uh, break them apart? And where does it all come from? And what is to be done about it? So I see it, you know, I mean, we are we are on the same side and we are saying the same sorts of things, but I put the, um, uh, in my map, the center is not just 92 and, you know, um, an event in, and 24. It's not that year and that year. It really um, belongs to a much larger scale of time and place. And that is why in this particular book, um, there's a lot of importance of uh, the um, uh, prejudices that in people like us, you know, who, who think we have risen above those prejudices or risen above that kind of narrowness and them discovering that they are also speaking a language which is um, troublesome. So I think this book is very much about that as well. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, I agree. But I think what part of what Gitanjali is saying is that history is a continuum and that these those years fall on the points in the continuum, but that it's a constant process that's unfolding. And I think, interestingly for me, I was translating this a year ago I was about 
halfway through the first draft, probably about a year ago, when Israel began to bomb Gaza. And for me, it felt, you know, one feels helpless watching the events unfold from afar. And so translating this book was a way for me to feel like as the characters are always worrying, they need to do something, they need to write something. And I felt like that was for me doing something and writing something was to translate to this book because it's really a very similar story, a story about, um, you know, unequal power relations and constantly cracking divisions, you know, between communities and a group that's in power or a majority feeling victimized by a, a minority or community or community with very little power. And so um, I think it has resonances to all different types of conflicts that um, are so, have similar narratives, you know, that, that also see themselves as positioned thousands of years back from the present. Um, which is also very similar to Israel and Palestine, um, or even watching the kind of the divisions created by Trumpism in the United States, I think is another similarity in watching the way that a community can take on a sort of cult-like set of beliefs that take over their entire lives. So I think this book has, it has a lot of importance for understanding conflicts in general, and how they unfold and how they paralyze communities and break up friendships and so on like that. Just to expand on that, the character Shruti is a writer, Shara than Honey for academics, and like you said, Daisy, the characters feel a very strong moral responsibility to speak up, but the magnitude of the situation makes them feel paralyzed and they struggle to find a way to express themselves. And that's also kind of where the narrator steps in to show that those with any capability to bear witness must do so. And I understood the novel to be looking at the difficulty and importance of writing and recording the truth in the face of violence across multiple cities and multiple years. We're witnessing examples of this across South Asia and, like you said, Daisy, in Palestine and beyond. So... Tell us about how you both view these current reflections of the book. Certainly, I mean, it, um, it's a theme which belongs very much to our times. We, we have to go into the history of what's happened in the world. But there's some kind of, uh, you know, great sort of cynicism. There's a lot of, you know, sort of um, breakdown of um, an ethical order. There's a, uh, there's a kind of breakdown of ideals, you know, people don't have, they don't know what they believe in any longer. There's a breakdown of faith. There's a lot of sort of suspicion and fear and insecurity. And in that atmosphere, I think this whole theme of, you know, uh, sort of suspicion between friends and uh, between communities has acquired momentous proportions. Perhaps, you know, like, and of course, the world has opened up like never before. So it's also very much uh, in our face. And it's, we just see it um, um, just across the board. So I think certainly we see that. I mean, look at Sri Lanka. I mean, n- name it. So many countries in Africa, so many countries in or certainly our great um, Palestine and Israel. I mean, look at what they're doing. And. India, and I think you can, Daisy can also speak about the US, I won't do that. But you know, this whole thing of uh, how people who have been together are suddenly competitors and fear each other and suspect each other, that has become extremely relevant. Yes, and then I think what you were talking about before, the um, the way that the narrator functions as this, how she feels that she's... Um, yeah, incapable, like that she has no skills, but that she has to keep copying down, she says. And um, whereas the real writers fail. And um, so it's interesting, I think, in the way in which the book is also about the failure of writing to combat 
the rise of sectarianism or communalism or, you know, divisions. And so the way that it's structured, the way the book is structured is it seems random, you know, because she doesn't know what she's doing according to her. Um, and so she's just writing down these little little snippets of what she sees and hears. And it's only as you get towards the end that it we you start to realize that a whole narrative has been woven by simply witnessing, you know, witnessing what's going on around. And I think that's an interesting way of thinking about the way that writers and intellectuals do often fail to to fight against the rise of this kind of this kind of narrative that that creates divisions. Mm. No, I forgot about that part of your uh, question. I think it's extremely important, and I'm glad Daisy brings up all these things. But it is very much uh, about the failure of the intellectual and the failure of the um, certainly imagination, the failure of imagination, the failure of the intellectual to know what's going on and it's like all the arguments that we have and all the explanations that we have have fallen short of uh, something because they have really not resolved the issue and that is the situation we are faced with so what are we left with we are left just with a sense of extreme urgency that there's something going on which can well you know destroy everything it's like in you know uh, the book um, adopts that as its form you know that it's like a bomb which is which is exploded you know and everything is just in smithereens and uh, the bits which don't fit well together and they're just thrown all over the uh, galaxy so, th- so the point is that we are suddenly at a moment when in fact there are those and we we, we know the kinds of people we're talking about who speak uh, in extremely sort of arrogant and uh, certain terms but what they're saying has become completely meaningless and it's you know not uh, able to clarify anything so what can you have you can only have somebody who is witness i'm glad she uses the word witness you know um, somebody who feels the urgency in the um, situation the urgency in the um, times and feels that maybe we cannot understand it at this moment but it is not something that we ha- we can forget or ignore somehow it has to be recorded and i do not know what's important i mean i is now the witness the narrator i do not know what is important i do not know what is going to add up to explain anything but i know that this um, the moment is passing and i better you know record it all because maybe there will be a moment of you know quiet and respite tomorrow when somebody with better skills will be able to make sense of what happened what went wrong with humanity and maybe then a way will be found and that is how the narrator gets uh, comes into being a narrator who does not understand just feels the urgency of the situation and is a kind of um, i won't say a dispassionate um, a uh, witness but um, an anxious witness who is so anxious that she even uh, uh, notes down things which uh, she feels are probably completely banal and uh, irrelevant but she feels who knows maybe there is some sense somewhere which has there is something hidden some meaning hidden in there which also has to be teased out and understood I am glad you brought up the narrator and I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. As our main characters find themselves paralyzed by anxiety and fear as violence erupts around them, each side is reacting to the other with suspicion, blame and intolerance. Shruti spends her time writing and rewriting the same sentences. Hanif is sidelined by his academic department and Sharad finds it increasingly difficult to connect with Hanif there's tension between them even though they're childhood friends as these multiple dividing lines are sharpening the narrator is the one left to bear witness and is transcribing everything that is happening this has to be one of the most incredible and unique narrators i've come across in writing 
Deepanjali, could you tell us about the kind of stylistic choice you've made in presenting the narrative arc of the story as such? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the um, stylistic choice was made for me by the kind of um, whatever impelled me to write, you know, because there was no neat story to tell. That was exactly the problem. The problem was that there is no clear story to tell, but the uh, confusion of the moment feels like a pressure one cannot get rid of. So it's a pressure one has to somehow respond to. Or like Daisy, I think, uh, said it a little while ago, you know, that whatever is happening, you feel you have to do something. Now you don't know doing what is going to, uh, you know, take us in some viable direction. But the point is that you have to do something. You can't sit back and do nothing. And you are not able to do anything else. So from this kind of um, complete sense of desperation, the form evolved and the voice evolved. So it was really not my doing. And I, I sometimes say it's a book not about clarity. It's a book about confusion. And I think in a way that's important because I think there are too many clarities being floated around left, right and center. And I think it's exactly, and exactly um, the time to question those clarities. Questioning has become... Um, something which is actually looked down upon in today's world. You mean the politics of today's world, you know, where questions are not important. And I think it's it's trying to reinstate the importance of questioning, of doubting, of looking at your own self and trying to see through your own, uh, uh, the, the chinks in your own, what do you say, arguments, the problems in your own narratives. So I think that is what the book started attempting and the form and the voice evolved from that impulse, yeah. I really like what you said about it being a book about confusion. And along those lines, translation is extremely challenging work and one can only imagine how exacting our city that year would have been given this complex voice and tone of the book, the unusual turns of phrase, surprising words and imagery, and especially in the use of this unique, almost omniscient perspective. So Daisy, I wanted to ask you, what were the particular challenges of translating this novel versus Tomb of Sand? Um, well, Tomb of Sand, you know, I think is full of this very complicated word play and so on like that so that was the big challenge was you know making sense of that of conveying that the the, um the language the use of language the sort of involvement in language as a thing of its own and in this book i think it was different the challenge was different and a part of it was the fragmentary nature of the narrator's little bits of of observations because she'll come into a conversation in the middle very often like she's eavesdropping you know it's like almost like she's sort of wandering in and out of rooms or standing near windows and listening and so on so sometimes she'll get a conversation right in the middle and it was very difficult dialogue is very difficult to translate because sometimes you don't even use the same word at all you know because it all has to do with people reacting off of each other. So if you can't understand what might have come before, then you don't know how to start the snippet, you know, in the middle of a conversation. So you have to kind of reconstruct the conversation in your mind so that you know how to start it off because it won't, a literal translation won't grasp that, or grasp the sort of the way that a conversation evolves or a dialogue evolves that was i think the hardest part for for me um no i was just thinking that perhaps i mean daisy will agree that the playfulness in um, tomb of sand allowed her to play much more freely you know there, there was not the same kind of freedom allowed in this book i mean it was um because of the kind of content you know, it was, so i think um in a way, it was uh, much more uh, 
it kind of tied you down a little more, even though the, there were all these fragmentations and there were these half sentences and uh, so on, half thoughts and something. But yeah. well, yeah, it was, I mean, there's a need to get it right because of the political nature, and also, I think with between the two of us, making sure that we were using the right English for Hindi because a lot of these discourses exist both in both languages. And so to make sure that the um the way the discourse was worded in English would match the way it, it would be um said if the characters had been speaking English. And um, you know, it's always important for me as an American to make the dialogue pl- at least plausibly Indian sounding because Indians speak English. So I don't, it's not that I would translate it in, into exactly into Indian English, but to make it plausible. Um, and actually one of the sort of fun parts about this book is the American character. I made her American. It was not clear if she was American or not, but I felt that she was American, Beverly. And that it was the only time when in my translation life when I could make the dialogue sound American and when my husband was reading it, he would keep laughing at at her lines because she's so clueless, you know. <laughs> the reason I thought she's American is because she says things like "I hate riots," you know, like who says that only an American would say something like that. Absolutely, those parts were definitely entertaining to read. Now, before we welcome you to present a short reading from the book where Geetanjali will be reading from the original Hindi and Daisy will be reading from the English translation. I'd like to take a moment to invite our listeners to check out our Patreon program to support Himal's independent journalism, including some of the most wide-ranging book reviews from around the region that relies on the support of our listeners like you. South Asia Review of Books is a podcast and a monthly newsletter that threads together our latest reviews literary interviews, and publishing news from around the region. You'll find a special reading list curated by Geetanjali and Daisy in this month's edition. So do sign up for the newsletter to keep up with our latest reviews, podcasts, and more. Now, Geetanjali and Daisy, over to you to read the excerpts from Our City That You. Yehi jage hai. Hamara shahar. Ghabra kar jis shahar mein nikal gaye the veteen, कि अपराध और अपराधी घायल और मुर्दे सबको निकाल लाएंगे साफ साफ देख लेंगे और जैसा साफ देख लेंगे वैसा ही साफ दिखा देंगे शरद श्रुति और हनीफ जिन्होंने ठान लिया था कि लिखेंगे कि इस वक्त चुप नहीं रहा जा सकता सब कुछ खोल कर रख देना है कि जो हवा चल रही है वो हवा नहीं बवंडर है जो हमें कहीं उखाड़ ना दे बारिश हो रही है ट्रेन से उतरकर श्रुति प्लेटफॉर्म पर खड़ी है एक थरथराहट भरी बेचैनी उसके पैरों के नीचे से गुजरकर ट्रेन के साथ साथ निकल जाती है लोग गिरते पड़ते भीगते बाहर को सवारियां ढूंढने दौड़ गए हैं शहर के गाय और कुत्ते पानी टपकाते प्लेटफॉर्म पर सुस्ताने चले आए हैं पानी पटरियों की तरफ रुख करके बह रहा है वीराना है उस बरस एक बार सड़कों पर ऐसी ही नदियां बहने लगी थी पर वो बारिश नहीं थी टंकियों का पानी था जो मोहल्लों के मोहल्लों ने जहर के डर से खोल कर बहा दिया था शरद दूर से उसे पहचान कर बढ़ा वो खड़ी रही अकेली इंतजार करती दोनों आमने सामने आ गए हैं उनके चेहरे उनके शब्दों में उलझ कर अजीब बंधी जकड़ी चुप्पी पैदा कर रहे हैं वे संभले कदमों से बाहर आ गए तीनों समझते थे कि सब कुछ वही बाहर था जो हमें इतना भयभीत और व्याकुल कर रहा था उन्हीं का डर था जो मुझ में भी भर गया था मैं घबराने लगी वे लिखने की कोशिश करते और बीच में छोड़ देते अपने लिखे को खोखला पाते और कहते सब रती रटाई बातें हैं जिनको लिखने से कुछ नहीं होगा क्योंकि वे हर तरफ नकारी जा रही हैं, सरकारी नारों की तरह बेमतलब हो चुकी है तब मुझे लगा था कि कुछ तो करना ही पड़ेगा कैसे भी हो लिखना तो पड़ेगा चाहे समझें या न समझें और वे न सही जिनमें से एक पेशेवर लेखिका थी और दो बुद्धिजीवी तो मैं ही सही जो बस नकल करता हो सकती थी 
उस वक्त में कुछ ऐसा नहीं था कि साफ दो टूक बात कही जाए तभी मैं लिख सकी जिसे न दो टूक कहने का तजुर्बा था न हट नकल उतारने को अगर लिखना कहें तो मैं बस वही कर रही थी वही कर सकती थी इनके पीछे पीछे रहकर जो टुकड़े उठाए उठा लू जो जहां मेरी नजर में पड़ जाए मेरी नजर के आगे वही घर है वही फाटक वही लेटर बॉक्स उसका पल्ला खुल गया है और बारिश की सतत बूंदे उसे हिला रही हैं। श्रुति फाटक पर ठिठक गई है उसकी चप्पलें ही नहीं पैर भी टखनों तक भीग गए हैं शरद ने फाटक खोला घर के सामने की खुली जगह में जंगली घास भर गई है वहां एक मधु मालती की लतर हुआ करती थी जिसके नीचे गुलाबी मसूड़ों पर सफेद दांतों की कतार देख कर अजीब मतली सी आई थी और मेरा कलम मेरे हाथ से छूट कर उसी के पास जा छिटका था बाद में मैंने सोचा भी कि क्यों नहीं उन्हें देखकर मुझे मधुमालती के गुलाबी और सफेद फूल याद आए उल्टे मधुमालती के फूलों को देखकर हमेशा वही गुलाबी मसूढ़े और सफेद दांत याद आ जाते और उपकाई सी आती न ही उन्हें देख वो सुंदर सेहत हंसी याद आई जो पूरे चेहरे को खिला देती थी वो धूल में पड़े हंसी की सारी सुंदरता को बेआबरू करते घिनौना आकार भर हो गए चेहरे की सारी शख्सियत को भुलाते उस इंसान के सारे अस्तित्व को गायब करते दद्दू कहते थे कि पहचान को गाढ़ी लकीरों से आकार बनाकर किसी टुकड़े में घुसेड़ोगे तो पहचान नहीं बेकार बेजान कट आउट रह जाएगा कि पहचान तो बाहर फूटती और फैलती और खुले में विचरती हर चीज से लिपटती घुलती रोशनी है जिसे किसी टुकड़े में बंद करोगे कि विशुद्ध अस्तित्व बनेगा तो बस बुझ जाएगी और मरा हुआ आकार रह जाएगा मांस का घिनौना लोथ सो दिस इज द प्लेस आवर सिटी इन टू दिस सिटी द थ्री ऑफ देम केम फॉर पैनिक डिटरमिन टू ब्रिंग एवरीथिंग टू द फोर the crime and the criminal the wounded and the dead all of it they would see clearly and clearly they would reveal whatever they saw shared shruti and hanif who had resolved that they would write that this time they could not remain silent that everything must be brought out into the open that the blowing wind was no breeze but a gale that they could not allow it to uproot them it's raining Shruti has stepped off the train and stands on the platform. A vibration, a trembling agitation passes beneath her feet and departs with the train. People run stumbling soaked searching for passengers outside. The city's cows and dogs have ambled in to laze on the flooded platform. The water flows towards the track, a wasteland. There was a time that year when such rivers flowed in the streets but they didn't come from the rain they came from the neighborhood water tanks that were emptied into the streets for fear they'd been poisoned Shared recognizes her from afar and approaches she stands alone waiting they come face to face their faces bound and in an inhibited silence they exit with measured steps The three of them understood that everything making us restless and frightened was right there outside. They faced the same fear that filled me. I too began to panic. They'd try to write and then stop midstream. They'd find their writing hollow and say all these words have been written before. Nothing will be accomplished by recording them. The words have become utterly useless, grown empty like government slogans. It was then that I realized I'd have to do something somehow or other. I'd have to write whether I understood or not. If it couldn't be the three of them, a professional writer and two intellectuals, it would have to be me, me who knows only how to copy down words. At that time, it was barely possible to string together two words of sense. Nonetheless, I, who had neither the experience to string words nor the tenacity, could write. If you call copying down writing then that's what I was doing that's what I could do I would pick up the fragments that flew up in their wake whatever caught my eye wherever before my eyes is that house that gate that letter box the flap of the letter box hangs open shivering in the rain Shruti hesitates at the gate 
Her sandals are soaking wet as are her feet up to the ankles. Shredded opens the gate. The front yard is overgrown with wild grasses. Once a Madhumalti vine had climbed here, and the sight beneath that vine of a row of white teeth in pink gums had sickened me. The pen had slipped from my hand, ink splattering. Later, I'd wonder why I hadn't recalled the pink and white blossoms of the Madhumalti vine when I saw the teeth and gums. Instead, Madhumalti's always remind me. Now, of those gums and those teeth, they nauseate me. Nor do I recall the rest of that face that used to blossom with laughter, that beautiful, hearty laugh. Instead, the face becomes a repulsive shape, lying in the dust, its individuality erased, defiling all the beauty of the laughter, wiping out the entire existence of the person to whom it had belonged. Dadu used to say that if you recognize a thing by only a fragment of the whole, then it becomes trapped in its own contour, a useless, lifeless caricature. True recognition bursts forth, spreading and wandering about in the open, enveloped by all things, melting into everything. It is light. If you trap it within a single fragment to purify it, you'll simply extinguish the light. The shape will be rendered lifeless, a repulsive lump of flesh. Thank you for those excellent readings. To me, one of the most fascinating characters of this book was Dadu, Shard's father and the owner of the main house the characters live in. He's almost like a third narrator. His laughter and the divan he sits on seem to literally have a life of its own. I also found myself looking closely at the music, poetry, and verses he recites, whether that's Gale, Bimson Joshi, or Faiz. That, to me, served almost as a contrast to the kind of communalist propaganda that's heard throughout their city. So tell us more about Dadu. Dadu is certainly a very, very important character for me, but not uh, because in any way I have invented him. Dadu is very much a character uh, who is very real in Indian society. And I would like to say that he is... um, emblematically Indian. I and mean, this is what an Indian is. I mean, in, there are many Indias and there are many Indias being created all the time. But I think there is this soul of India which is very much made of um, someone who is fed by so many cultural streams and so many linguistic streams and you know is all about um, generosity and humanity and you know, very Catholic um, vision he has, and uh, nothing bigoted about him. You know, sort of pluralistic, which is what I think innately India is. So I think Dadu represents that very important uh, Indian, and an Indian we don't want ever to die, and an Indian we have all our hopes of and from. This is the Indian who will survive and will save India from whatever narrowness uh, has, you know, um, overtaken it in many quarters today. Yes, I mean, he is he is the sort of not, we wouldn't say the secular India because he's actually you know, immersed in everything, you know. He's like I think for a lot of people, the the one of the failures of secularism is like the feeling that it it drains religion or it drains feeling out of things, and so um, so he he kind of embodies all the cultural streams, you know, syncretism rather than secularism. So he loves he reads in Urdu and he loves Urdu poetry. Um, he's a Hindu, but he has engaged in some uh, Muslim rituals and he feels that all these streams used to exist in a certain kind of harmony. Um, Well, you know, there's a funny exchange that he and Shruti have about how in his day they would never eat at a Muslim's house and yet they got along better with Muslims. So they observed this kind of 
taboo about eating, but the these modern people like Shruti and Hanif, they don't care who cooked their food and will happily eat at anybody's house and yet they they seem to have a, a lot more problems than um than existed in his day so it's a kind of interesting reading of um of the solution to the problem as as is syn- syncretism over secularism i think but it's so i mean, so i think to, uh, i would like to drive home this point that Dadu is not at all a contrived character. Dadu indeed is somebody who is very real in India. That's one thing. And about, um, you know, this thing about him saying that um, in his time, they followed rules of who to eat with and what, what uh, you know, followed rules of uh, food and I think also marriage to some extent. So let's remember that we are talking of a society which is full of all kinds of you know, different rituals and divisive rituals, you know, because a lot of which have to be questioned, particularly, you know, the untouchability, you know, that division definitely has to be inequality, definitely has to be completely, you know, demolished. So there's no compromise on that. But what the point he's making is that, you know, the, there was a recognition and respect for difference. It, you know, so uh, Hanif and Shruti think they have got rid of all those differences and their greater problems or different kinds of problems in their time, while in his time they were respecting each other's difference. Uh, when he gave the example of eating and not eating with a Muslim, but you know, socializing and how and what, you know, respecting each other's ways and customs. So there's something to be said here, I mean, it's not about the specific thing that you accept. You may not accept this particular custom, but the uh, the, the value that he's putting forth is of respecting the other and allowing the other to be different. So that is the value which is being put forth, and that is important. I'm really glad I got to hear more about this character from your perspectives as well, and. Daisy, in the translator's note, you point out that there are some surprising echoes of Tomb of Sand in this novel. Without giving too much away, one that caught my attention was laughter. It takes on a life of its own in both books. In Tomb of Sand, there's serious son or overseas son's inability to laugh, whereas in Our City that year, Dadu's laughter can literally fill balloons that float about the room. And another major theme that cuts through both books is borders. There's all kinds of borders between individuals in society, progressive and conservative, Hindu and Muslim, and the books show that borders should not be separators. It can be a bridge where two sides meet and both flourish. Could you tell us more about these parallels? And Daisy in particular, what was it like to encounter these echoes in your process of translating Our City that year after Tomb of Sand? Well, I think it's, it's sort of funny in a way because I did them, you know, not in chronological order. And so I, you know, I think later Gitanjali is much more experimental than earlier Gitanjali. But what I think was interesting as if perhaps if I'd done them the other way around, I would have found the the experimental elements in our city that year um, more surprising or difficult to cope with. But I knew I recognized them right away. They were like old friends, and so you know, like the the way that uh, that those divan. It becomes sort of anthropomorphized, but it's subtle, you know, like in Tim of Sand, it would probably be much more in the open. It's very subtle how she writes it so that if I wasn't paying attention, like even the copy editor would say like, oh, do you mean Dadu turned his face from the door? And I said, no, it's the Devon that turned its face from the door. So even as a translator, I could have misunderstood that you know or or and left it out and so but since i knew 
um, you know, I had spent so much time with these kinds of imaginings in Term of Sand, I was completely ready for the balloons and, and that kind of thing. And um, whereas I feel like if I'd done it the other way around, I would have thought, well, this is kind of strange. I don't know where this is coming from. Like, did she really mean that? I might have even written to her and said, did you mean that the, the, that the divan turned its face away or the man sitting on the divan? But I didn't ask her because I already knew what was happening. So um, I think it's interesting to see the way an author develops over time certain motifs. And, um, you know, and, they, and I, I think every author that I've translated multiple books of, you see... Um, there are certain preoccupations that always come up, you know, like the borders, because um, I've translated some of Gitanjali's short stories that also have these borders. Um, and I think of them as, you know, in the other, in, except for Tomb of Sand, the other books aren't about partition per se, but they... Um, there are always these invisible partitions she's interested in that are that are constantly in process and happening in contemporary society. Um, so I, I love to see the development of that idea as I translate her work. I learn a lot about my own writing from the translator. So it's really <laughs> nice. But I'm very happy, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm happy that um, humor is a recurring motive because humor, I think, is a very important uh, way of um, getting to whatever truth is you know I mean I'm not talking of um, I'm talking of you know truth <laughs> within quotes so I think it's a very important way of um, getting to that of of destabilizing uh, reality and facts and you know sort of uh, displacing them and finding those glimmers which um, bring out something i think humor is a wonderful way of doing it and i'm so glad it re recurs in my work i mean i haven't tried but i hope it means that there's it's very much part of me in my creative process and borders i mean i'm i'm just I, i'm it's it's being told to me and i like it very much you know uh, to find that this yes indeed and i think again you know it's not just about me i think it's very much about the um, society that i belong to you know, which is, and I'm not talking nationalistic, I'm talking of the society and the community across the world, you know, of us like-minded people where borders have these meanings rather than what the usual meaning of a border is. So I'm really, uh, it's really um, um, without my deliberately trying to represent anybody I think I am representing this larger community, which is very pluralistic, very much about mutuality, very much about, um, you know, interacting and giving and taking. And, and I'm happy, you know, that it recurs in my writing. Absolutely. And like you've just said, the novel to me deals with the kind of absurdity of boundaries almost, whether that's between people, genders, religions, but also between languages. In our city that year, the characters have debates on Sanskrit and Urdu and how the language is mixed together, how it thrives and expands. Even in your collaborations, the border between writer and translator, between Hindi and English, has to be porous. There's a merging of the writer-translator identity. So tell us about what draws each of you to writing and translating Hindi literature in particular. Or writing. I mean, I don't translate. But I mean, in a different way, maybe I do, but uh, not uh, not translating from Hindi. I'm translating from the in inchoate, in inarticulate to articulate. So, in some say or uh, some reality, something somewhere, some smoky, um, unclear thing, concretizing it. So, there's a translation of some sort going on. But obviously, um, the next. Um, kind of translation is different but why i write in hindi is actually very simple i mean it's my it's a language which is closest to me it's a language uh, which uh, you know lives in me in many registers 
so i think that um, helps me to express myself better in hindi it is you know one has to discover it as one goes along but i think it's again very much a language uh, without uh, you know uh, again rhetorically speaking without borders i think a language does not borders borders is what a language has and i think every language uh, really is a multilingual um, thing and uh, it's something some other concern ideological political whatever which tries to you know sort of pare it down to something pure and remove things from it otherwise every language is potentially an innately a, a multilingual entity and hindi certainly par excellence and my hindi uh, reveals in that you know so i i, I really have no uh, compunctions about borrowing from here and there and taking risks if it doesn't work then i'll learn and next time not do it but if something works then i'm happy i mean i've carried it through so the point is that um, um, it's uh, very much about living in a language which is uh, constantly borrowing from the languages it has come in contact with and it's not just about sanskrit and persian it's also about all the other languages across the hindi belt uh, from and not just that you know uh, basically from north india i mean the, the not that much borrowing between um, from the languages uh, you know south of the vindhyas but from gujarat from maharashtra right across the board you know there's just such a lot of borrowing going on in the hindi language and uh, it makes for such a rich language i mean it has problems there are problems of uh, there's a politics of language in there as well and there are problems and there are there's fighting of various uh, kinds and hostilities and all that also goes on and there's of course the fact that hindi is uh, supposed to be promoted by the powers that be although that has nothing to do with the hindi which is um, really the sp- spoken hindi and the language of the people so that is some other very fake and false hindi which nobody believes in which is being you know pushed down people's throat so we are not talking of that but even this hindi is just so vast and variegated that um, it's sometimes quite uh, amusing that you could have 10 books of hindi literature and each would be you know sort of almost in a different language it's got the nagari script but you know they all it sort of has its own flavors and own uh, area of uh, you know where it's borrowed from so it's a it's different hindis that have come uh, you know made these different uh, novels and it's that i think is quite fantastic that is a rich side of the language and i belong to that and i happy to carry on in that but daisy will talk about why hindi <laughs> yes um Yeah, I mean that's what makes Hindi difficult to translate actually is because you could have 10 different books that are almost in 10 different languages because you know people for example their authors like Renu who bring all this Bhojpuri Mathili into their writing and even if it's not technically in Mathili the sentences have some different kind of feeling to them and that's very different from Urdu which even though it's you know in some ways the same language when you're speaking casually um Urdu literature is is much more standardized the style and the writing and Hindi is full of experimentation it's it's a younger literature the modern standard Hindi written in in Nagari script is a younger literature and so and it's interesting you know i prefer translating Hindi that has a lot of Urdu in it, and Gitanjali uses a lot of Urdu, and it, she's interested in that shared, the shared linguistic heritage. And so there are parts, you know, that are are hard to convey in English. Where, for example, Hanif will use a very flowery Urdu that has a lot of Persian loanwords, and I can't obviously put those into English. It wouldn't mean anything to people, but. I try to make his style of speech when he's talking like that feel different you know like to feel a little bit flowery because he is he's not just speaking or do he is being flowery he's like telling his strange jokes you know 
um, but he uses a kind of interesting turns of phrase and so on. So I try to just make the, you know, English doesn't have the same linguistic situation going on, but it has ways to create textures. Um, and so I try to create a different texture for Hanif when he's speaking Urdu, or if the, um, you know, the um, leader of the ashram is speaking a very Sanskritized Hindi, I try to kind of use more Latinate words that sound very formal in English. Um, so I think that's one of the interesting and and um, challenges of translating Hindi, which I really enjoy, is is trying to recreate the textures without um, being able to use the actual language or linguistic differences. What's next in terms of your individual projects? Is there another translation of Gitanjali's work we can look forward to? Oh, I was just going to say, yes, we have a, a collection of short stories will be next. And Gitanjali is also possibly finished a new novel. I've finished a novel, but uh, I, I, I'm at that stage. I, I told Daisy just a few days ago that I'm waiting for some you know, mysterious inner voice to say, okay, let it go now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've just got it with me and I'm, I keep looking at it and I read it a few times and you know, just do something to one word somewhere. But basically it's ready and I just have to hand it to the publisher as soon as that little bird speaks or little bird tweets. <laughs> yeah. We'll be eagerly looking forward to those books as well. And we'd love to get your reading recommendations for most read books of Hindi literature by women, whether that's in translation or in the original Hindi. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you very quickly because uh, I think Daisy will have uh, more learned things to say about it. I've really not been following translations. You know, see how the translations are. But I know some of these writers have been translated, so I'll only talk about few writers who are, it would be lovely, you know, I'm sure it would be most rewarding to read them. So if you talk of um, some iconic writers who are very senior to me, they'll be Krishna Sorti. And I'm talking of Hindi, Urdu, Urdu both uh, literatures, Krishna Sorti, Isma Chukai, and uh, Khadija Masood. I know all three would have been translated, and some by Daisy. And uh, in my time, I mean, so talking of some of the younger writers, I'll just name... Uh, Sara Rai, very, very fine stories, and I know they've been translated. Um, Alka Saraugi, well-known writer, novels and stories. And uh, two younger writers, Pratyaksha and Nilakshi Singh. So for the moment, that's my list. And I'm sure I've forgotten others. I mean, interesting things are being written, written but I haven't looked at the translations. Well, she, she made it easy for me because she mentioned some that I've translated. Uh, Krishna Sobhati, I translated her final novel, A Gujarat Here, A Gujarat There. And I've been for quite some time trying, working on possibly retranslating some of her work. Most of her work has been translated, but um, some of the earlier translations are not that great because it's like Gitanjali, she's very difficult to translate um she has lots of experimental use of language and so on so so i i do hope to get some of those done they're also i think mostly out of print they were done by the translations were published by kata publications which isn't really um producing publications anymore translations only i think they're mostly only bringing out books for children um, Khadija Mastur, an Urdu writer, which uh, Gitanjali mentioned, I've translated both of her novels, A Promised Land and The Women's Courtyard. Um, and excitingly, The Women's Courtyard is going to come out from Penguin Classics in the U.S. in next summer. So it will be available outside of South Asia for the first time, because there's really very little of this work that's available outside of south asia and then let's see um i think most of the other people that Gitanjali mentioned are translated except for the younger authors and i've been you know for years trying to get permission to redo kurt delane heider's uh, 
but she translated it herself um and but very famously changed a lot which you know is what happens if you're the writer because you just keep editing it and she was much older so she probably viewed things differently and so on so many people would like to be able to see that work translated in a in a style that's um closer to the original but she also has many works that are out in translation and so I would definitely recommend them to readers even even if they're not retranslated Thank you both for the brilliant conversation and reading recommendations and for taking the time to speak with us today. It was a pleasure to have you on the podcast and many congratulations again on Asiti Bhatia and the forthcoming books. Thank you so much for having us Shweta. Yeah, it was really nice. It was a good conversation. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the South Asia Review of Books podcast from Himal South Asian. This episode was edited by Ritika Chauhan. If you like this episode, please share widely, rate, review, subscribe, and download the show on your favorite podcast apps. You can find Geetanjali and Daisy's reading list for the episode in this month's South Asia Review of Books newsletter. You can find the links to subscribe and listen to previous episodes on our website at himalmag.com. What we do and what we love doing at Himal is really looking at South Asian literature like no other. And that gives us a very unique community, viewpoint and the privilege of making conversations like this possible. So if you'd like to help us out, please do become a Himal patron. We have a great program with lots of perks including Himal's right side up map and we'll welcome you to a fantastic South Asia review of books community. Thanks again and until next time.